and you get to hear all of the things that you are asking questions about, and it might answer your questions in a really fun way. In Romans 1.16, Paul said, I am not ashamed of the gospel, the good news, because it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes. See, that's what Rachel Scott got. So I'm not ashamed of the gospel anymore because it is the power of God that brings life into people and it brings life into the people in such a dramatic way that the kingdom of light is able to invade the kingdom of darkness in their life. And Rachel Scott said, I'm not ashamed of that anymore. And that's what happens to us when we begin to embrace God. I don't care about me anymore. I just want you to be elevated. And the third thing, turn to verse 15 there. It says, the time has come. The kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe the good news. So the kingdom, number three, is about the demonstration of the good news. Okay? We got two things here to keep things in a balance in our life in the kingdom. We want to proclaim the good news. We want to tell people about how much God loves them. And I hope that today you hear that, how much God loves you, and he's calling you into relationship with him. But the other side of the balance there is we're called to demonstrate the power of the kingdom coming. And that's what Jesus did. Read the gospel, friends. Jesus is proclaiming the good news. You ever heard of the Sermon on the Mount? Many people believe this is the greatest teaching that man has ever heard. But Jesus also demonstrated the power of the kingdom in his life. The power of the kingdom is like what validates the message of the kingdom. You with me? You see how it fits together here? And that's what God wants in the church. Unfortunately, the church has focused on just a proclamation of it, and they kind of stuffed the demonstration of it because it's not very safe, and it's not very controllable. And one of the reasons I like the book of Mark, the book of Mark, it just jumps right in. I mean, it starts off running. The first thing that happens with Jesus after he's teaching in a synagogue is a demon-possessed man starts, he starts showing these demons in him, and Jesus casts a demon out of him in church. Did you know demons can come into church? So the first thing that happens as Jesus is teaching in the synagogue is he encounters a demon and he casts it out of a man. It's a power encounter of the kingdom. And so when Jesus gets to 12 guys that he calls to him, you know, Peter, James, John, all those guys, the disciples, he says, okay, guys, this is Matthew 10. You've been watching me do this for nine chapters. <laughs> now, here's what's going to happen, guys. I'm sending you out two by two. And as you go out in verse 7, it says, proclaim the good news. And many of us are going, okay, I can do that. But then he said, heal the sick, cast out demons, heal the lepers, which, which was like the AIDS of that culture. And then he says, to top it off, raise the dead. And the way some of you look right now, we need to do that with you. I'm just kidding. You look awesome. So they go out and do this. Then in Luke 10, after the 12, a more crowd starts following because people want to hear about God. They want to hear about the kingdom of God, but people were seeing the power of the kingdom, and a crowd was drawn to them. So now he sends out 72 of them that were following Jesus two by two. And he says, now you guys go and proclaim the kingdom of God, heal the sick, and cast out demons. 
And they went out and they came back and they were so excited. They were saying, Jesus, even the demons laughed when we told them to. And Jesus said, just be glad your names are written in the book of life. You see, what happens, friends, and this is what I would love to see in all of our lives, is that we start, what John Wimber, who started the vineyard, he coined the phrase, to do the stuff. Meaning that we're all called to do this stuff, to do this kingdom stuff. And when you do that, you start experiencing the power of God moving through you, your life will never be the same, friend. It will never be the same. But some of us live within, not some of us, all of us, we live within this tension that I want to address now. We live within this tension of Jesus said the kingdom of God is at hand, right? John the Baptist said the kingdom of God is near. Jesus later said in Matthew 12, 28, the kingdom of God is here. What he's talking about, look at this next slide. In this slide, talking about the age to come of the kingdom of God. In the Old Testament, it goes to the book of Exodus. They're taken out of Egypt, brought into uh, Israel. They go into captivity, the Babylonians and all these other guys that didn't like them. And then there's that silent period. And then the coming of Jesus is the beginning of the age of the church. Now, this age of the church... But Jesus said the kingdom of God is here. What he's saying is now the kingdom has come into the world through me. And later, Jesus is talking to his disciples and said, hey guys, I got to go. I'm leaving so that the spirit can come and live within you. When that happened in Acts 2, have you heard of Pentecost? And the Holy Spirit came and filled all the people, and they began to speak in different languages. That was the beginning of the kingdom coming into the church, the kingdom of God coming into the church through the inhabitation of the Holy Spirit and all the believers. And so the kingdom of God, if you are a believer in Jesus and you have confessed Christ as your Lord and Savior, and you have prayed that, the Holy Spirit has come and in you. You are inhabited by the kingdom of God. That's pretty cool, isn't it? Through the Holy Spirit. But within this age, we are still living within this present evil age. So we are living within this tension of the kingdom of God being here, but the kingdom of darkness is still here. The kingdom of God has come, but it hasn't come in its fullness yet. And when it comes in its fullness, as we know, when light comes into darkness, where does, the light, where does the darkness go? It has to go. Light invades darkness. So when Jesus Christ comes back a second time, then the kingdom of God will totally inhabit the world, and the world will be transformed into its original perfect state. We were even talking about this when we were eating lunch at Castle Pines, looking at one of the most beautiful places on the planet of Earth. And we were thinking, this is nothing compared to what it's going to be like when Jesus returns. But because of this, we live within this tension. Kingdom of heaven is here. Kingdom of God is here. But we are living within this tension of the kingdom of darkness here. So that's why we still deal with issues like sickness. That's why... We're going to die. Turn to your neighbor and say, great news, we're going to die. <laughs> like, duh. Unless Jesus comes back first, we will physically die, but we will live eternally, right? With a new heavenly body that Christ will give us. But we still deal with stuff like addictions. We still deal with stuff like marital problems. We still deal with stuff like the Broncos having no defense. All of those things are a cause of the fall. <laughs> and that's why we wonder 
You know, I thought the kingdom of God is here. Why is still things messed up in my life? Well, it's because of the presence of old red legs is still around, and he's still wrecking havoc in our life. But God calls us in to engage against the darkness, to engage against the presence of the enemy, and to begin to learn the authority that he gives us to overcome it. Now, for those of you that like good news, in 2 Timoth- 2 Thessalonians, verse 2, I mean, chapter 2, verse 1. Do you know the Lord's coming back? It says, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered to him. And this is what theologians have given the term the rapture of the church being gathered to Christ. And some people are thinking, if you're any, if you've thought about this much, there's this thing called the tribulation where the enemy takes over, red legs takes over rule of the world and all the governments and it just wreaks havoc over all of the world and and some people are thinking I hope the church gets gathered up to Jesus before that happens they call that pre-tribbers right and then there's people saying oh no we're going to have to live through it but God will sustain us and most of us will be martyred those are the post-tribbers I'm a pan-tribber what that means is it prepare for post, hope for pre, but just know that in the end, it all pans out. Okay? Because biblically, you can make an argument for both sides and pretty strong arguments. Theologians have been doing that for years. But it says to not become unsettled or alarmed by some prophecy report or letters supposed to have come from us saying that the day of the Lord has already come. And that would just be the biggest bummer in the world to just realize, you know, all my Christian friends are gone. He says, don't let anyone deceive you in any way for that day will not come until the rebellion occurs and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the man doomed to destruction. So this talk about during that tribulation period, either pre, some say even mid, some say at the end, the Lord is coming back. But just know the Lord is coming back. But until that day, we are called to engage in this kingdom of God lifestyle. That is the most exciting lifestyle that God would ever call us to. And you know, Part of that, as we heard from Matthew 10, is he calls us to pray for the sick. One of the things that keeps us from praying for the sick is you may have done it and they didn't get better. And so you go, I'm not doing that anymore. You know, those of us type A personalities, we don't want to do anything unless it happens the right way, right? (laughs) So you want to go bowling? No, I'm not going to go bowling. I'm horrible at bowling. Are you that kind of a person? So you just won't pray for anybody. Because of this kingdom tension we live within, when we pray for people and we pray for the kingdom of God to come, the Holy Spirit would move in their life and bring healing in their life, sometimes they get healed instantaneously. Sometimes they get healed partially. Sometimes they don't get healed at all. Because as we live within this tension of being within the two kingdoms here, God is sovereign and God is in control, not us. All he does, calls us to do, is to be faithful and to pray for the sick, to proclaim the good news, and to cast out demons. And I tell you, friends, as I began to start doing this in faith, saying, okay, God, I'm going to look like a fool, but I'm going to start doing this. I remember the first time that I prayed for a person, for a demon to lead their life. She was hearing voices telling her to kill herself. And as she received Christ, and we cast three demons out of her, she opened up her eyes, and a smile came on her face. You can see the light come in her, and I said, what's going on? And she said, the voices are gone. From that day on, I knew demons were real. 
and I knew that God could use me. You know, in Canyon City, we practiced this all the time. We always prayed for the sick, and we told people, you go pray for the sick. And one of the things that the church does, they say, I can't go pray for the sick. We gotta get a pastor to do it. Jesus doesn't say, okay, guys, get the pastors to do this. He says, no, you go. He sent out the 72 men and women that were following him. You guys go and do this now. I love what Jesus does. John Wimber also said, it's a big playing field and everybody gets to play. You guys are invited to join us to play. And so he calls these guys in verse 16. As Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come follow me, Jesus said, and I will make you fishers of men to go proclaim the kingdom of God through the power of the kingdom of God in them. At once they left their nets and followed him. Just as they left their nets and followed Jesus, he calls us each right now, tonight, will you follow me? Will you come and do the kingdom stuff with me? When he'd gone a little farther, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John in a boat preparing their nets. Without delay, he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. They were willing to even leave their very fathers to go follow Jesus. Leonard Sweet, he said that we should be doing W-I-J-D, not W-W-J-D. And what he meant by that, what would Jesus do, W-W-J-D, right? The old bracelets, and you see it uh, on the bumper stickers. It was real popular a couple years ago. Everyone's going, well, what would Jesus do in this situation, and are we doing what Jesus would do? And by the time we're done asking that question and wondering about that, the thing you're supposed to do is already done. But what Leonard Sweet says is, W-I-J-D is what is Jesus doing? What is Jesus doing right now in this person's life, and what does he want you to do in joining in with what Jesus is doing in that person's life? That, my friends, is walking in the Spirit is following the Spirit's lead. And I want you guys to hear a testimony of a brother here. When I heard this story of what happened in this guy's life, I said, the church needs to hear this. This is so encouraging for all of us to see that God is alive and well today, and he's in the business of changing lives. Let's watch this interview of our brother Jerry. Jerry, thanks for uh, coming and uh, sharing your story with us. When, when I heard your story from uh, Jake, I just said, man, the church needs to hear this. And Thank I you. was wondering if you could share a little bit of a summary of where your life was at a few years ago before you, uh, your life was invaded by the mm. kingdom of God. Oh, uh, um, going back to when I first... Uh, left the church when I was 13 years old. I was born and raised in a Baptist background and 